Cade McDonald is an AFL YouTuber, vlogger, podcaster, gamer, and musician. Having launched his channel in earnest in 2016, Caden originally started YouTube in a bid to aid his entry into a potential media career. But it's fair to say the channel took off, at first largely due to the success of his popular AFL parody songs. At a time where AFL on YouTube wasn't really a thing, Caden adapted content from soccer YouTubers in the UK and gave them an AFL twist, and he is now looked upon as the pioneer of the AFL YouTube community. In a very special True Footy Podcast 50, Caden and I have a chat about his life as a YouTuber, the Melbourne Footy Club, and what's on the horizon for him in the future. We hope you enjoy the episode. All right, g'day guys. Welcome to True Footy Podcast 50. It's a milestone milestone podcast, and uh, thankfully I am joined by Caden McDonald, the famous YouTube star. Uh, welcome, Caden. Thanks for joining us on the True Footy Podcast. How are you? Yeah, good, Jesse. Uh, raise the bat. True footy faithful. It's uh, it's been a been a good little innings early. So uh, yeah, still got plenty of work to go though. Not quite at the hundred. So uh, head down, That's ass it. up, and uh, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Thanks, mate. Um, first of all, how is everything over there? Uh, in it's Torquay. You live right? Yeah. So uh, live with. Uh, I was going to say live with Cook. I live in Torquay with Cook. Yeah. I'm actually just outside of Torquay at the moment. Dad and I got out of the old little shack that we were in. So we're sort of in between Torquay and Geelong. But it's um, yeah, it's a bit nervous times, given the current climate. Um, yeah, everyone's doing their social distancing, which doesn't really affect me too much in terms of I'm just in this little uh, little studio most of the time. But, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's going all right. Cool, that's good to hear, mate. Because um, these are troublesome times for some of us, if uh, people who are familiar with this channel no i'm uh, i'm in two weeks of self-isolation so plenty of time to smash out content which is uh both you know kind of scary but also um i'm kind of enjoying it to be honest as well but uh again thanks for coming on man you're a guy i wanted to get on to the podcast pretty much as soon as we started it um so it's really cool to have you here now so like I said to Kuko, there's a good chance that everyone who's watching this is familiar with your channel. You've got like nearly 42,000 subscribers. But uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us or the listeners what your channel is and who you are for someone who might not have heard of you? Um, uh, yeah, so the channel is just um, like very laid back, take the piss sort of, uh, I'd almost say comedy, but it's not quite comedy type channel um i get a lot of my mates involved and it seems to center around footy a little bit and that wasn't the goal at the start it was just to make videos for the sake of making videos but um yeah after a little bit it slowly turned into more of a footy centered channel and um that's what i'm sort of honing in on in uh honing in on at the moment just trying to pump out footy stuff and you know i grew up loving footy um and all my mates played footy and get around footy so uh, yeah, we all just take the piss and have a kick, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, nice one. So, I guess the simple first question is, what actually prompted you to start? What was the, the logic behind that? Um, so, I've always wanted to make a YouTube channel, probably like yourself and like a lot of the people out there who have made their channels and, and watch this stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I always wanted to make a YouTube channel, watched a lot of YouTube growing up and... Um, yeah, I just always wanted to be creative. And then at the end of school, they were sort of saying, what do you want to do? And I was sort of nervous to tell the careers lady that I wanted to do a media personality type job. So I, I thought, you know, saying I want to be, um, you know, an entertainer or something sounded a little bit silly. So I just told them radio. And that's something that I did want to do, um, heavily inspired by Hamish and Andy and Fitzy and Whippa and everyone else out there you know, who, who's grown up watching or listening to radio would get around people like that. But, um, yeah, I, I wanted to do radio, so I started trying to get into that industry and it was being quite difficult. I thought I had a bit of a breakthrough when I um, did a radio course and after that six-month radio course, I was applying for jobs more regionally than, like, in your capital cities because your capital cities are hard to crack into and, um, yeah, I thought I was on the brink. I was on the brink with a couple of jobs. I was almost in Bunbury. Um, I applied for a job in Bunbury. I was applying everywhere all over the country. I'm from Bunbury. Are you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I could have been working at, um, I can't remember the station. Hit, Hot, Hot FM, FM probably? probably? Yeah, it was, it was Hot FM, the SCA. 
bracket. It, it might have wow. been them, but they needed a um, an ad, a uh, an audio producer to do ads. So like whip wow. ads up. So they sent me over like um, like little clips and little like sound effects, and they're like, make an ad out of this. And I was just doing it on Audacity because <laughs> that's all I knew. Yeah. And I got to the top two. And I was having like real interviews. They're like, so how are you going to go with the move over here? Do you want to, you know, do you know Pro Tools, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, I don't know it, but I'm keen to learn it. And then um, I kept pushing to them. I'm like, but can I get on air from this job? And they're like, look, we don't want to put two years of work into a bloke to teach them how to do audio producing for them just to go on it on air. We need like an audio producer. Right. And um, so, yeah, there was jobs all over the country that I was just very close to getting. There was oh, jobs in the middle of Tassie and middle of New South Wales and um, I just couldn't get into the the radio industry and it was doing my head in. So I just started making YouTube videos and um, six months and seven months and eight months passed and no one was watching. But for some reason, I just thought, I don't know, I just I wanted to do something every week that was creative because I couldn't get into a radio station. And then, um, yeah, slowly but surely that started to overtake the uh, the satisfaction and the, the desire for radio. So I stuck with it. I guess, so would you say, well, I would say based on that, like for a start, that's really good advice for people who want to sort of get into media. Would you agree? Because you've kind of, if you look back at it now, you've spent, uh, how many years you've been doing it? Um, so I started putting videos up in 2016. I started consistently putting out air content. Yeah, cool. So like in that time, you've built kind of like your own personal CV that you can sort of use and pivot into the media, right? Like you've done work with the AFL. Um, so I think that's like a really good sort of lesson for anyone in your shoes, really. Um, well, so yeah, we- that, that's, um, sorry to cut you off, but that's, that's, right. an, that's initially why I was doing it because um, my, yeah, my resume was like a bit of community radio, did a six month course, bit of work experience, but I had nothing else. So I was like, oh man, if I could show them all these videos, and they could see that I could edit and, um, you know, the comedic timing and, you know, they might get me on the show to do digital producing or something. So it started, I, I used to update my um, my resume all the time as I'd send it to radio jobs. So it started like, um, oh, a part-time passion of mine is to create YouTube videos and I have 2,000 subs and 50,000 total watch views. And then like a, a couple of months later, I was like sending off to another job and I'd go on my YouTube and I'm like, oh, I've got 3,000 subs and, 100,000, you know, total channel views. And then the more I I kept having to update my resume, I was like, I'm just going to do YouTube. Like, why? (laughs) But, but yeah, initially it was to to thicken the resume and have a body of work behind me. And, you know, instead of writing, I can, I am funny and I can do this stuff. I thought I'd just show them. And slowly but surely, yeah, that's how it started to overtake the uh, the radio desire. That's cool. What, because I I had a quick look at your channel. Am I right in thinking, like, in the first five or six videos, you did, like, two parodies? Those those parody songs you did? I privated a few. I was never going to private anything. But for the first six months, I was doing, like, skits, like, really, like, very cringe now. I'm probably cringe at the time. But they had, like, an element of, like, if you knew, you knew. Like, everyone sort of, like, all my mates loved them, Mm -hmm. um, even though they were shot really shit. And... The concepts were really, really dumb. Um, yeah, so they, they are cringe to look at and they, they were cringe. But then I, I just thought, oh, they're not footy stuff, so I got rid of them. I might upload them again one yeah. day. But, yeah, for the first few months it was like just, you know, throwing shit at the wall and hoping it stuck. And I was doing that for ages and just skit after skit. And even like I was doing – I don't know if they're still up, but I was doing like – um like yearly reviews of the year. I was doing like pizza shape um, uh, flavor reviews. I was doing like just anything, anything I could think of. I was just putting it out there, um, which I think, you know, that's something I tell people who want to do YouTube. I'm like, just put anything up and you'll find what you want to do. But, um, and then, yeah, so I started in about, you know, about this time in 2016. And then by about June or July, I put out, um, one of the first parodies, which was Free Kick to Hawthorne, and it was yep. just edited poorly. I sung it on a um, on an app that records singing. <laughs> uh, Shmuel, I think it is, like a karaoke app, and you can print off your, your recording for the day. So I did it in one take, and uh, 
yeah, that started to gather a little bit of momentum. So then after that got a bit of momentum in September, I did like three or four parodies in like two months just because <laughs> everyone wanted to see them. So. Yeah, that that's huge, man. Like I was thinking you've actually with your range of content is actually massive. Like you said, you can make parodies, you started making music, music videos, you do podcasting, you do vlogs, you do gaming vids, and that's on top of all your other sort of like filler videos like your TMAs and stuff. What is what is your favorite thing to produce? When are you, when would you say you're actually in your element? Because there's quite a like range there. Um favorite thing. Well, I, I sort of love them all for different reasons, and then I sort of hate them all for different reasons. So <laughs> I loved parodies because um, I can't sing and I've never been trained musically, but I've always, um, I could always fiddle around with a piano or pick up a guitar and have a bit of a strum, not to any level that would um, <laughs> sort of, you know, uh, re- uh, like gather a musical career, but I, I could just always stuff around with it and I, and I loved it. Um, so I, I love making parodies because I could sort of, uh have this you know pop stardom sort of persona and and live vicariously through my comedic football songs and you know just sort of stuff around have a bit of a laugh but in my head I'm sort of satisfying the the dream to be Harry Styles essentially so I, I loved that I loved like um creating you know the parodies and and having them all done and then like the build up it's coming Thursday it's coming Thursday watch out and then seeing people get around them I love doing stuff like that. Um, but then I, I started to dislike it because it was like every comment would be, do another one. Like I just yeah, right. uh, took me two weeks to record, two weeks to edit. Um, I used to sometimes film on the day that I said I'd bring it out. So me and Cook would get up at 6 a.m. because I'm like, I'm got all, <laughs> I need to edit all day. So we'd get up at 6 a.m. and film a couple of them. And then I'd get it out and it'd be like, do another one. I'm like, I don't want to. Um, yeah. So I, I'd say parodies – even like AFL goal recreations, absolutely love, but they take forever. Like there's just so much happening in those videos. Yeah, uh, yeah in, in my most – what yeah, the place that I love the most at the moment, um, I, I love doing the podcast, but also um, probably just – I'm trying to create original music, which, you know, doesn't really make sense for a bloke who can't sing and <laughs> – you know, can't strum. And- oh, you're pretty good in back pocket plugger. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in in, in that song. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I at this point in time, my favourite place to be is um, just in my mate's studio up in Melbourne, creating music because, we're, you know, instead of just doing one song and releasing it, we're trying to do four or five footy songs, and they're not all comedic, they're, but they're all footy related, and. Um, just, I don't know, I, I couldn't be an artist because if I made a banging song that's going to be my hit single that you can't release for two years, I'd go crazy. <laughs> I'd go, oh, my God, yeah. I want to release it. So, And that might happen because if footy doesn't come back, I'm not sure whether I will release my EP. But <laughs> Yeah, right. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, because that will affect it. I reckon you should. How, how, how is that going, the one you, you're working on an EP? Uh, yeah, so loving it. We got five songs, one... The first song, I wanted it to be like um, music people could use for like a highlights video. Yeah. So it's like, it sounds like you're going to war and it's like inspirational and it's got like footy lyrics and, um, you know, people listen to that who like my parodies, they'd be like, what is this? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I think pe- people that subscribe will get it. Other people probably won't. Um, and then the next three are just like absolute as back pocket pluggery as they get um and then the last one's just like a song about going to the footy so there's a bit of a mixture and um yeah i'm just loving it it's just a fun process that's cool with uh one thing i want to ask you as well as like a fellow youtuber what part of like this whole youtube process do you like like i noticed you said you you, you don't want to um release music because it's too long. You obviously like the short turnaround stuff of YouTube. But like in terms of like planning videos, producing them, editing, and then publishing and pu- uh, post-upload, do you have a favorite point or do you feel like you're in your element the whole time? Or um, Yeah, I don't, I don't love, I, I don't know. I, I sort of, sometimes I can dread editing, but I would say 
if I've got something that I love and I and we haven't filmed for too long, like filming's been punchy and um, I've got a clear idea and it's I know it's going to be a good video. I love just sinking the teeth into editing, even if it takes a couple of days. So if I do make a AFL goal recreation and it's going to take at least uh, 16 to 20 hours to, to make, I, I don't mind just sinking my teeth into it. But then again, on, on the other – so I would say editing. Uh, you know, filming um, can sometimes take a lot of effort and sometimes I just get frustrated doing it because it's like, you know, if I if I mumble my words and I'm not hitting the points or, you know, sometimes I'll have an idea and I'm like, that is hilarious. I'll get in front of the camera and it's just not coming – out of the back of the hand, right? I'm just like, oh, my God, this is so frustrating. Why can't I just do the idea that came into my head? Um, but I, I would say, yeah, when it's something that I absolutely love, I know people are going to love and I really want to do it, I would say editing is probably my favourite thing to do because slowly but surely you see the idea come to life. But um, to, just to contradict what I've just said, sometimes editing can be an absolute nightmare when I'm not passionate about it and it's like I'm just getting this one out as a bit of a filler video just to get me through this week. I'm not passionate about it. Uh, you know, it, that that sort of video could take me six hours when I could do it in an hour if I just sat there. But True. I'll procrastinate because it's like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not as passionate about yeah, putting it out. Yeah, that's true, man. I just had probably the, my least favorite edit ever. I did a round one review that's just like me talking over footage for 28 minutes. And my God, it was probably like the biggest slog ever. I hated it. But generally, I'm the same. I kind of like editing. I like editing our podcast. Um, but then, but for me, editing's a lot more like I don't have the same sort of editing skill as you. So my mind's very simple. It's just like camera shot, title, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? So it's not too bad. Do you guys, yeah. you guys have a couple of different camera angles? Yep. And do you cut between them? So you got to go through the whole time and... I do, yeah. Yeah, how, how is that? Is that... Because, like, sometimes stuff like that, it's just so seamless. Like, you'll sit there, punch out the hour. It's yeah. pretty easy. But sometimes little things like that, it's like, I know this is easy to do, but it's going to take so long, so I'll just keep putting it off. Yeah, I know what you mean. No, for, I'm actually really good at editing the podcast in the sense that as soon as I get home from Bushes, I'm onto it, and I usually smash it out in, like, a few hours um, for some reason. I don't know. I, I guess because, ultimately, I like watching them back. Um, so that way all I'm doing is just like snip, snip, snip. That's the extent of the editing. It's not like I'm doing something at every like five seconds. I mean, or like, it's not like I'm doing anything more intricate than that. Um, but we just started doing that. I realized the other day I could, or like a few podcasts to go, I can actually just split screen the whole time and just have Bush on one side of me yeah, yeah, on side and I could actually upload it straight away. But I don't know. I kind of like that more produced kind of look, but um, but yeah, no. To answer your question, it takes a while, but I enjoy it, so I keep doing it. Well, yeah, because there's people that sometimes hit me up and go, "How do you get into editing? How do, you know? Are you like I, I've had um I've had people see some of my stuff, and just because they know that I edit, I don't think they were aware of the quality of the edit in terms of how I just do it off <laughs> shitty software, <laughs> and it's sure. just a little bit uh you know, hacky at times, but, um, yeah, I, I've been hit up and like, Oh, you edit. Do you want to help me out with this? And I'm like, Oh, I don't actually, I wouldn't say that I, I'm an editor. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's just funny. Like people will ask, Oh, oh how'd you get into editing and blah, 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 blah. And like the short answer is the only reason I edit is because no one else would make my videos for me <laughs> <laughs> so, like in a selfish way. So it's sort of like, um, like the only reason I'm sitting here for 16 hours and editing is because, I want this idea to be seen and if I don't do it, no one's going to see it sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. You, you, you're kind of forced into it. When I when we started the podcast, I was going to be in charge of all the, the marketing of the and the social media side of it and Joycey was going to do the editing. Um, but then it, it just got like, like he was busy with work and stuff like that and it just came to a point where like I had to force myself to do it even though I hated it and at first I just I like I really struggle with it uh, but then over time you just get better at it and to be honest I'm still punching out movies on iMovie uh, videos rather on iMovie so like yeah like you said it doesn't it doesn't have to be world-class software um, especially for someone starting out I think like Mr. Beast um, or no David Dobrik definitely still uses iMovie and he's really at the top of the game yeah his videos are so if he asked myself or Cooko to do it, I 
like I don't think you would really realise that it wasn't David editing. Yeah. Which, yeah. which gives me, you know, a little bit of a <laughs> pride because like yeah. he's at the top of the game. And then like you hear stories that Mr. Beast used iMovie and an iPhone for his th- first thousand videos. So yeah, it wow. genuine, genuinely doesn't really matter, which yeah. is um, crazy. And then, you know, sometimes I'm sure you feel the same because I think we've got the same um, sort of mindset in terms of like, I've heard you talk about upskilling before and uh, getting better and getting better. Like a part of me goes, you know, oh, my YouTube channel doesn't look that good because it, it doesn't look like a piece from Channel 7. Like it's yeah, just not, yeah. it's not polished yet. But um, I don't think that should stop anyone from putting stuff out because, you know, an iPhone and iMovie is all you need really. Yeah, that's very true, man. I like – I made the jump in like from like uh, – my first 5,000 subs a, in iMovie, but also I didn't even know, like, know anything about lighting or have the settings on my camera up until about 6,000 <laughs> subscribers, which is crazy. And like subsequently, since I've learned about that, my audio visual quality is better than ever. And like I said to you before we started the show, my views are <laughs> worse than ever. So it's, it's, it's really it's all really about all... just like, just grind <laughs> out, uh, and you'll get better eventually. But well, yeah, I, I was shooting, um, I was shooting a food inventor with Mikey the uh, a couple of months ago, like a video where I just whip up crazy food. And um, he, he is someone who knows how to use cameras. And um, we were in the car and I'm like, oh, you know, just record. And he's like, yeah, but what are your settings on? I'm like, <laughs> they're on automatic. Just like you just record. He's like, no, but we're in the car. You've got to change the lighting. I'm like, yeah, it does it itself. You just record. And he's like, He's like, no, and, and he was saying, you don't want to change the settings. And I'm like, I don't want you to change the settings because I don't know how to change them back. So <laughs> I'm like, I just leave it like, and that's what me and Cook do. We leave everything on automatic. and just That that makes me feel better because I'm exactly the same. Well, yeah, uh, at one point, yeah, even like frame rate and stuff, like when we were doing, um, we we're on the set of footy at home and they were like every, you know, there was two cameras and they, they were TV size cameras and they're like, like we would stand around for like 10 minutes because the cameras had to be in the right spot. I mean, Cook are like, if we're not in frame, just crop us in. Like, I don't know. Just, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing? And then they'd say stuff like, uh, what, what, what's your frame rate? Oh, I'm going to do, uh, I'll do 80 for this one. And we're like, what are you talking about? And wow. I don't know. We were learning so much on the set. Um, that, yeah. But it just shows how little we know about all that stuff. I just press record and just try and get it out, really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm the same as you, man, for sure, for sure. Um, just getting back quickly to sort of like the YouTube stuff and how that started. One thing I wanted to ask you is like, because you started obviously sometime before Cooko and maybe it's a little bit different these days, but when you started doing the YouTube thing, how did your friends and family sort of perceive that? Did they sort of jump on board or like, for instance, like I was saying to Cooko, like I'm still, I would still feel too self-conscious to go out with my mates and just take the camera around. Um, but like you, you seem to have no trouble doing that. Like you, I've seen uh, in your vlogs, you, like you, you just shut your girlfriend on camera and stuff like that. Um, so like, obviously you've built a lot of confidence with that. Did you find that your friends and family were pretty supportive from the get go or did it take time for them to get it? Um, so I was so down, I was so down and out about the radio industry, not wanting a bar of me. And I I was really flat when I started YouTube. So, um, I've had conversations with all my mates about starting a YouTube channel between 16 and 20 and, um, all my mates watched YouTube and got around it, but I only told Cooko and Dutch, um, two blokes that are regulars in my videos, I only told them that I was doing it and maybe a radio lecturer. So I was putting it out, getting four or five views, and I was just hoping something took off. Um, and then I didn't even tell Mitter, and Mitter's like, you know, the biggest <laughs> um, YouTube fan ever and one of the biggest supporters of myself. So I, I was just really self-conscious and... Um, yeah, I just didn't want anyone else to know. I, I sort of wanted to get 50,000 subs before I told anyone I was doing it. I sort of wanted to make it before anyone knew. Um, so, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, really, really f- in my shell about it all. And I, I'd send, you know, videos to my radio lecturer and, um, yeah, try and get that feedback. But it wasn't until the uh, Arnott Shapes taste test video that I put it on Facebook. 
and I posted it on Facebook and um, I, it got like a thousand views and I was like, oh, that's crazy. All my other ones <laughs> are getting 20 or 30 views and the one I post on Facebook had a thousand. So people were definitely checking it out. And then I still had the bat- uh, the backlog of like all the cringy skits and every kind of video still up there. And I, I went to a party um, soon after and, you know, one, one of the kids from school that was sort of in the cool group um, came up and he's like, oh, uh, we, you know, I've seen some of your vids. And I'm like, oh, far out like oh no this is the worst thing ever and he's like me and the boys we chuck them on the tv and we watch like all 20 they're so funny man they're so funny and full-blown got around them and i was like what what are you talking about and then like i'd get snapchats of like yeah the the cooler kids from school or whatever putting my shitty skits on where i'm dressed as a girl and like dressed in glasses and like just looking like a dickhead and they're like pissing themselves at it so it was sort of like I was scared of what people would say. I was like, I was really, really nervous of um, everyone's perception. And once I put myself fully out there, because I don't think uploading to no one is putting yourself out there. Once I posted it on Facebook and everyone knew, yeah, I got support and that probably built the covenants to keep going. But I've definitely had, um, yeah, so yeah, to answer your question, everyone had, had been supportive. But I, I definitely had those mates who, you know, when I first got my camera, I rocked up to my mate's house and I, I didn't have a job. Um, I, I was trying to volunteer at the radio uh, station in Geelong, um, but I didn't have a job and I was on Centrelink and like just out of school. And, you know, it looked like I was a bit of a bum, but I was like, I don't want to work at a supermarket when I can be in radio soon. Like that was my mindset. I was like, I don't want to work at a cafe when I could, you know, I'm, I'm months, a couple of months away, I'll be on the Fox. Like that, that was, that was, in my head but um yeah i rocked up to my mate's place with a camera and one of my mates is like what do you have a camera for i'm like oh you know i just you know i just picked it up and he's like, oh, what you think you can do youtube videos blah 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 so I, i've definitely had like people like that but overwhelmingly it was like this is sick keep it up and i i thought it would be more negative like i thought it would be more what are you doing and there probably were people like that. It's just only one of them said it to me. <laughs> so, yeah, everyone else, everyone else was just getting around me. And I think that's an important lesson is, you know, especially for someone like myself who overthinks. It's like um, you're probably your harshest critic. And, like, you know, I'm pro- you know, I'm like, oh, my videos are shit. Then, you know, they're not very good. But other people watch them and go, oh, that was pretty funny. Oh, he's just having a, you know, he's just having a bit of a crack. Like, you know, it is what it is. So um, it was funny that, yeah, when I finally put myself out there, um, yeah, people, you know, got, and people were getting around me just for putting yourself out there, let alone the video. So it's like, people were like, oh, you, you've got the balls to chuck your video up on Facebook. That's like, that's impressive. Like, um, but yeah, everyone was super supportive, which is, which is cool. Yeah. That's really good to hear, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I must say I've, I've been lucky in the same way. Um, but I must say that like when, it doesn't happen as often for me as it probably happens for you, but, like, occasionally when someone, like, will see me at a footy game and know who I am, as soon as they tell me they've watched True Footy, I, my automatic reaction is to cringe and be like, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> I just, oh, like, no, like, yeah. I don't have that same belief. I'm not, like, don't take pride in it in the way that I'm like, oh, thank, oh, sick. Like, I, um, I'm um, i reaching all these people. My first reaction is, oh, God, uh, like, I hope they're not terrible. <laughs> but, like, was there a point for you... Because obviously, well, I think, like, am I, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of doubled the size of your channel in the last 12 months, right? So, w- at what point did it switch for you and, like, people started recognizing you and then it, did you sort of felt like, maybe not that you've made it, because I know you've talked about you've got big goals, but, like, where did it kind of switch for you and, like, people recognize you and that so that sort of became that sort of thing? Um, yeah, so... F- Firstly, I, like me, I don't think I'll ever feel like I've made it. And I, I, I genuinely don't feel like that at all because, um, like, I watch YouTube and I think I've said to Cook and stuff before, like, we look at YouTubers and, like, you know, you shoot, you, like a YouTuber is someone who's, you know, quite well off financially, um, doing it in a professional setting, like their stuff looks professional, even though, like, your David Dobrik's don't. Um, uh but, like, yeah, I think of, like, the Sidemen or Cal Freezy or Calix or, like, any of the English boys with a someone who edits their stuff, someone who films them. That's who I think of a YouTuber is. Like, a million subs minimum. Big house. Yeah. Um, 
So, and I don't think I'll ever get, get there, especially doing footy stuff. But I, yeah, I just, I don't know. In my head, it's like, I still feel like it's 2016 and I'm trying to get into radio. Like, I still feel like I'm trying to get somewhere. Okay. Um, which, which is quite, yeah, quite funny. But uh, the first time I got recognised was, I would have been at a thousand subs. I would have been a thousand or two thousand subs. I, I don't know if um, Melbourne's a bubble or like Victoria's a footy bubble, um, because some of my mates have said like we'll be you know out and about, and kids will come up and you know Connor in particular will go, well, you've got ten thousand subs, but it, it it almost seems like you've got a hundred thousand because people come up. And I'm like, yeah, it must just be a bubble. Melbourne must just be a bubble. But I was working at the golf course, Anglesey Golf Course, uh, washing dishes, had my apron on, and I was bringing some of the uh, cafe cutlery out to the front, front of house. And as I walked past, this was the first time ever, some kid's jaw just dropped. And I was like, that is the weirdest facial expression anyone <laughs> has given me. Like, that it doesn't make any sense. Like, he's, I was like... So, and it had never happened before. And I was only, yeah, a thousand or two thousand subs. So I go back and I'm washing dishes with my mate Jordo. And I'm like, I think some kid recognized me. And he's like, what? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. It, some kid just made the weirdest face. He's like, what, what are you talking about? So we wash dishes. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm like, do I go back out there and ask him? Like, what am I, <laughs> like, do I go, hey, why do you look at me weird? Like, I don't know. In my head, I'm like, what is going on? And then um, my uh, one of the waitresses, like one of the like um, vet- veteran waitresses comes and goes, oh, Caden, there's someone out-, out there to see you. I think it's your little cousin or something. I'm like, my little cousin? None of my cousins live down here. Like, what is going on? Anyway, so I go out there and this kid's like shocked and his mum goes, oh, can we get a photo, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just in my apron and, like, dirty clothes and washing <laughs> dishes. I would love to see that photo because I look like a piece of shit. Like, I just have, like, the weirdest hat on and um, I look so disheveled. And then I come back and, like, the waitresses were like, oh, you're a celebrity, you're a celebrity. And I'm like, well, I think I loved it at the time probably, trying to be something I wasn't. But, yeah, so it happened quite early and then consistently, um, yeah, just kids come up at the footy and, I suppose that initial reaction would be like um, almost to play it down, like play the interaction down. And I found that that would be worse. So someone might come up and go, um, oh, okay, no, I, like I love your stuff. Can I get a photo or whatever? And, and you go, oh, yeah, sure. Like you're sort of like, you're not like, because you don't want to be like, yeah, man, yeah. So initially like you'd play it down it would, it would have become quite awkward like I, I think Ricky Gervais has a story where he's like oh the first person that came up and said oh can I get an autograph he said oh why <laughs> and then it made the person feel bad yeah so right it, it's sort of like yeah it, it would I don't know it, it took a lot of getting used to um initially like it was an odd interaction that if you didn't nail like I would go home and go I hope they don't hate me like I, I, I was just trying to I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's crazy that anyone <laughs> comes up. It's, um, it's yeah, a, a weird feeling. Yeah, for sure, man, I bet. Um, the other question is as well that I wanted to ask you is in three or four years of doing this, how do you feel like YouTube has changed you or developed you as a person? Because you've been, you've been sort of out, not outspoken, but you've been like um, open on your podcast as to, sometimes you're a little bit anxious or like maybe not the most outgoing person, um, which is a common trend I've found among YouTubers. But how do you, do you feel like it's kind of changed who you are a little bit or developed you in certain areas since you started? Um, yeah, it definitely has. Um, like I've always been an overthinker and a little bit anxious and, um, I, yeah, I've just thought that that's just who I am. So I suppose like it's changed will help me develop in terms of like it, it got me out of my shell a little bit which sounds weird because a, a kid who's 18 19 thinking he's going to be on the fox in a week or two doesn't sound like he's he's too uh self-conscious but I definitely was I just thought like I'd rather be self-conscious on the footy show than be self-conscious um in an office that I hated <laughs> yeah. so as dumb as that sounds but then it does come with its challenges a little bit so um 
I think it's made me, yeah, a little bit more outgoing. I think it's probably dragged me out of my shell a little bit. And at times I feel like I've gotten out of my shell. Um, Cause for some reason I walk around always feeling like there's a, you know, at least an ankle or a toe still in the shell. But I, I think doing footy at home where we're away from home for days on end, we're at shoot days. There's two or three footy players coming through a day. There's a big thing of um, camera crews and stuff. And that, that's an overwhelming thought for someone like myself because I just start putting the pressure on myself. Like, everyone's here. If I don't rock up today, no one can work. Like, I, for some reason, I start having, like, weird thoughts. Right. Of, like, if, if I don't go tomorrow, everyone's going to get mad. And it's like, well, of course I'm going tomorrow. But I don't know. I, I, it's just the pressure. The pressure of the day um, can get a little bit overwhelming. But, um, yeah, doing something like that just got me fully out of it. Like, I'd, I'd rock up to... Um, yeah, sets like that, and then um, we, like, we did footy golf, which is like another thing that is a little bit overwhelming. That you know, once I sunk my teeth into, I felt more comfortable in. So, yeah, I think I'd I'd rather be doing YouTube and having you know my, my nerves than um, be doing something I hated and have my nerves. But I think yeah, YouTube's definitely it's definitely helped me push myself and get myself um, yeah out of the shell <laughs> as yeah. as yeah. That's good. The one thing I really like about you and Cookso, uh, Cookso, Cookson as a like a podcast duo is um, you guys actually quite remind me of myself and Joycey. Um, and Joycey was the, the original co-founder of True Footy Podcast um, because like I feel like I'm more like you and Joycey is really like Cookson in the way that when you're, because like you, as I said, you open up quite a lot in your podcast and you talk about sort of being an overthinker and that's like me. I'm kind of like that. Um, yeah. and, and then I look at Cookson and he's just like, what? I've never felt like that in my life. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but it's quite funny because like Joycey dis- would describe himself as he's, he's described himself as like emotionally simple. Like he just doesn't overthink things and everything. His attitude is like, oh, that's all right. Like who cares? You know what I mean? Um, that's, that's the one thing I really like about your podcast. Um, do you feel like you've become, I don't want to I'll, I'll say honest with your audience uh, not to say you were ever dishonest with them but like on the podcast have you found it easier over time to to be more open and and if so if that is that like a deliberate decision or is that just something that's naturally happened um so honesty is like and um or authenticity is like the main thing that i want to be on youtube um like someone i watched for years and years was joe waller and um when he lost the fight against KSI instead of going, oh, yeah, I lost the fight, but that was a good experience and, uh, you know, I learned very well. He came and he came on, like, on, onto his video and just said, oh, I bottled it. I fucked it. Like, I got nervous and fucked it. And I went, oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> like, he's just called it as it is. What the hell? <laughs> like, that it blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, if, if he had a nightmare in, like, this Wembley Cup or whatever, he'd be like, oh, the pressure got to me. I, I, I stuffed it. <laughs> and, like, oh, I just love that honesty. Like, I've seen, you know, he didn't upload for a few years or, like, whatever, and he would just come out and say, look, I've been clinically depressed and I, I find it hard to battle that. And I've seen the, the kid cry on cam and uh, he's definitely made me laugh on camera. But I admire his honesty and I don't think I've ever been nearly as honest in that, um, in terms of to that extent, because I don't, yeah. I don't want to give people ammo um, in a certain sure. way. Like, you know, there's lots of things that I could share, but it's like then if someone uses that uh, as a tool to, I don't know, be a bit negative, that how, how am I going to feel? Like if I'm definitely rock solid and I'm talking about, um, you know, my nerves and uh, anxieties and blah, 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 and then someone goes, oh, you're anxious, loser, then I'm probably going to be fine. But if I am in an anxious headspace and I do – talk about it and then everyone knows but yeah um it could make it worse but it's only been recently where i felt like i've even started opening up a little bit on the pod and the first one was just a bit of an accident like when we were talking about um nerves and feeling overwhelmed and stuff like that um that just sort of came out organically and a part of me was like i'm just going to clip this out because um yeah especially over the last few months i have really felt like you know, overwhelmed and, and nervous and stuff like that. So, I, you know, when someone comes out and goes, oh, 
I, I was an alcoholic and I was in rehab. It's sort of like they've completed their process and they're back. So they're talking about what it was like. And I felt like when I mentioned my nerves, I was still <laughs> the alcoholic right. drinking. Like I, I've yeah. sort of come out and said, I'm an alcoholic with beers in my hands. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I was, yeah, I found it, yeah, just a little bit. I was like, I probably shouldn't have spoken about it in that time. But then after talking about it, the messages that I got were like crazy. And it wasn't like, you're a hero, Macca well done it was like oh i feel the same and that was massive so it wasn't even like people saying well done for talking about it it was just the people saying me too and i know how dumb that sounds because a lot of people um i don't know yeah it was just a realization i was like oh the messages that i'm receiving are like similar and it just you know people who listened were probably like um oh hearing him say that makes me feel better which i didn't really think of but it was like the messages of people saying, oh, me too, Doss, made me feel better. Oh, that's so uh, after that, um, yeah, we've had a couple of pods where we dip our toes into like other sort of topics. Um, and every time I go, oh, that was a bit, that was a bit uh, too real. Um, yeah, right. The DMs <laughs> and stuff are really, really positive and like people share their stories. So it makes me feel a little bit better. So I feel like, we're only just starting to get into that honesty and um, I, I'm, I'm loving it because um, I feel like the pod is a safe space as well. Like if I made a video being brutally honest, that's a, you know, that's way too outgoing for me. But if it's 47 minutes into an hour and a half potty, it's like people who are listening are actual listeners and um, I don't mind sharing my stuff with the real ones. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. Um, well, that's good. I noticed that uh, in your comments section, your subscribers sort of like really seem to respond to that honest conversation, which is good. And I like, uh, obviously, mental health is a big to- topic in modern society. So it's good to, to be able to sort of contribute in that small way, I guess. Um, I do have to ask about the flip side, because I think this is beneficial for like maybe young YouTubers as well. For someone who maybe overthinks, and I'm like I said, I'm the same. How do you deal with um, negativity online? Is it something you've gotten better at? Because, like, obviously, like, I don't look at your channel and think anyone should have anything bad to say, but at 41,000 subscribers, you're going to cop shit. If I'm copying shit at 7,000, you're probably copying, <laughs> you know, it's just the reality of, of YouTube, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's not a reflection on you. But, like, how do you how do you cope with it? Is it something that still gives you the shits? Um, so, I, I, I go, well, just... I go a long way to answering these questions, so I'm sorry if I'm rambling too long. But I like. Oh to take no, the, uh, keep it up. Uh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I like to take the, uh, the the long way around. But um, it, at first, yeah, it started happening when some of my stuff would enter um, audience that aren't mine. So if I yeah. uploaded to 200 subscribers, you know, 200 subscribers are, are people who are. Like the views of the people who are watching, it's not really going outside of the, the bubble. But when um, some of my songs got picked up by Facebook pages and they'd share them, um, that's when I'd go through and uh, uh, it's just like, uh, yeah, it wasn't like people were like, what is it? Like, yeah, yeah, there's just a lot of comments like, what, what is this kid doing? Oh, geez, he's got too much time in his hands. And then there was some that I'd go through and it was like, you know, a rough looking bloke tagged five of his mates and he's like, this. C has to die or like wow geez this and it wasn't to me so it wasn't like a dm and it wasn't on my stuff and it's like sure. i found i found it so partially my fault but <laughs> i was just going through and i was like stuff like that you know i, I, I would sit there and go why like it, why does he want to um and anyone else like cook i would read that and go oh. but i'd read that and go he wants me to die why yeah. do I have to die? I haven't done anything. I'm just singing about the Hawks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, it's I, I don't receive too too much hate though. Like it's, I, I think what's made it funny is, like if I just read them by myself and sat on them, it probably becoming like more negative in my own head, and you know, I'd probably think about them too much. But a quick screenshot and sent to my mate's group inbox and we just start pulling the piss. Like that makes it so much easier. Or like if I share it with someone else um, and they go, Oh, that's pretty funny. It's like, Oh, I don't know. Um, It just makes it um, quite funny. And then like we, you know, we start 
you know, talking about their profile picture or I don't know. We get our we get our own back just by yeah. like having a bit of a laugh in an inbox, and I think that's a great way to do it because um, I, I never want to reply and start something that doesn't have to happen. I don't mind just screenshotting it and then privately just having a bit of a laugh or just showing the boys because they might go, oh, that's a bit far, and I don't know. Just having them know what something's yes. been written, it just makes it feel a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. That's true, man. I don't know about you, but sometimes like I find um, some comments which are like cl- clearly quite brutal, like on most days I won't even care and I'll laugh at it. And then sometimes somebody will write something just a little bit offhanded. I'll be like, fuck you, you fuck widow. And then I'll like, I'll really struggle not to reply. <laughs> but I, I think some of the funniest ones I've had were um, we did the grand final live stream and 25,000 views, which is huge for us. And but the problem is with the thumbnail. I thought I was really happy with it, but I think it made people think it was a stream of the game. So so that's and we had, and so, we had uh, the YouTuber in me goes, "You've done your job, then." But well, that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. But the thing is, like, some of the comments just made me piss myself laughing. The other mistake we had was we fucking ate KFC during the stream, which like was being picked up by the microphones. It's so gross. And some of the comments were just hilarious. It was like, "I came on to watch the game, and now I'm just looking at two faggots eating KFC." <laughs> So, like, stuff like that, which is fucking brutal, like, makes me laugh till I'm, like, crying. But the other day, even someone just wrote, um, like, no, I wouldn't say I got pissed off because I don't think they were meant it in this harsh way. But, like, I obviously went on holiday and I scheduled five videos to drop while I was away. And, like, on the fourth one to drop, somebody wrote, you go on holiday too much. You're not looking after your channel. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I've just spent the last two weeks scheduling stuff in so you guys have <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I reckon, um, like, some that are just outrageous, like, look at this fucking loser, blah, 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 I don't. Like, stuff yeah. like that doesn't really hit me. But little things like, oh, uh, you haven't been putting too much effort in the last few videos. And, you know, maybe yeah. I haven't. I go, fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's so true. When there's an element of truth in it. 100%. Like, uh, yeah, so, yeah, the little ones that, yeah, especially if I'm feeling it. Like, uh, I think one of the – it wasn't hate, but it was like um, during August and September, we were really flat out filming footy at home and even into September. And then we had a lot of opportunities with Aussie rules and stuff like that. And we were doing the brown low on Monday. Um, and then I said, I'll happily do some Insta stories for Aussie rules uh, um, sto- uh, Instagram but I at, at the brown low, but I do much – Brownlow stream every year and I want to do it and it's going to be hard to finish at seven in Melbourne and get back to Torquay by eight or nine o'clock almost impossible and we worked yeah. around it that I could do it um, in an office in Melbourne so I had all my camera equipment there blah 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 blah. so I was really flat out and then the Tuesday I was editing the goal recreation or I think I had it out for Tuesday or something um, which meant like the last week I was doing a video that takes three days and because in my head I'm like Usually I just put the goal recreation out um, at the end of the year and the song out maybe a month after footy just because I'm lazy. But this year I'm like, I'm going to make this grand final week the biggest week ever. I'm going to have like the, the stream. I'm going to have goal recreation. Everyone, like the kids love that one. I'm going to have the end of year song. And it killed me. Like having that week mm. killed me. <laughs> um, so I was just absolutely flat. And I, I'd work my, like I had four hours sleep like every night. Um, and then on the Friday, like I just got the song up on the Thursday on the Friday, we're at the, um, the parade early in the morning. Like it was just a hectic week. And then all the comments were like, like I brought the song out on the Thursday. Um, thinking everyone would get around them. And the, the comments were like, the season's not done yet though. And I was like, yeah, but it's about the season. It's not a bit like the grand finals a bit irrelevant in like, I don't think, I know I mentioned it in 2018 parody, but I don't think I've really mentioned the grand final before. Yeah. And everyone was like, why are you putting it out now? What? Why have you put it? What? Like the season's not even done. What are you? Wow. Oh, and I was like, oh man, this is wow. <laughs> this is brutal. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's the and it's the ones that are a little bit truth truthful. Like I think some of the comments were like, oh, this looks rushed, and I'm like, well, it's not, but it sort of is. Like my week's been rushed, so I can tell. Yeah. I understand why it looks that way, but um, yeah, I, I, like as you say, like you just laugh most of the off anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, man. That's true. The other thing I want to ask you as well is, um, like, it's like I said to Cooko, I asked him the same question, but 
I kind of do this by myself and uh, I don't really know any other YouTubers around me or if I do, the ones in Perth have never actually met. But for you who was doing this for a few years, what was it like when Coco decided to start up a, uh, his own channel? Was that, were you stoked with that? Because, and I imagine like it must be so much more fun these days having someone like a partner in crime to do it with. What's that been like for you having someone else there? Oh yeah, so good. Um, so initially he was in all like even the 2016 videos he was in a few of them um yeah. in 2017 he was in a few more and then it just got to the point where kids were just like make your own channel make your own channel make your own channel and um like i, I was at the radio course in like 2015 and cook was like yeah I'd, I'd love to be on radio with you but i don't want to do the course <laughs> and i was like oh i'm like but if you do the course then you know we're both you know not that you need to be qualified but we'll both have the skills and like the knowledge to, to hit the industry. So even like yep. way back then, um, he was almost thinking about doing similar stuff. And, um, you know, we, we made a YouTube channel when we were 15 and 13 or 16 and 14 or something, um, the Caden and whatever YouTube channel, cause we were going to start making stuff and we just didn't like, we, he, he's someone who's <laughs> been almost, um, a YouTuber as long as I've almost been a YouTuber. Um, and yeah, then he would make jokes. Like he'd be in a lot of the videos, but he sort of make jokes like, Oh, I'll, I'll make a channel when you get a little bit bigger. It's like, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll make one then. Um, and then like all the comments were just like pushing him to. So he just made it. And it, it was so good because, you know, a lot of people say, why aren't Mitter and Dutch and stuff in my videos as much? And the simple answer is <laughs> they got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like middle of the week, they're working. Uh, Dutch is in Melbourne. Um, you know, I'd love to side minute up and have all of them in all of my videos. But the reality is like, you know, it's so good having Cook who very like-minded doing the same thing. And it's sort of like, oh, do you want to come over and film four videos today? Yeah, sweet. Yeah, it's the best. It's um, it's so cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of that. Um, um, <laughs> one last question on YouTube, because uh, like, I did the same thing with Cooker. I talked more about the YouTube stuff than I plan because I'm like enjoying it. But um, yeah. um, you've it's been like quite a long journey for you. In 2019, obviously, you've started doing work for the AFL and stuff like that. But if I had to ask you a simple question, what at what point? would you say was the high point for you in this whole experience? Like what's been the point where you've been like, fuck, this is sick. Uh, there must've been a few. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's so funny because it's sort of like 2018. I think at the start of 2018, I had 10,000 odd. Um, and I, you know, I just, uh, is that all 10,000? I, th I think so. I think at the start of, tw at the start of 2018, I think it would have had about 10,000, um, I believe. And then, I don't know, all of a sudden, a year later, I'm talking to the AFL. So, yeah. uh, you know, by the end of 2018, I think I had 20,000, but it was just weird that like, you know, in the space of a year, I'm sort of not, I'm, I'm closer to the, uh, yeah. the three man skits that I did <laughs> than actually being anything. I don't know. So it was so weird. Cause I still felt like, you know, I don't know. I didn't. Yeah, it took a little while to feel get used to the AFL stuff because we'd go to the sets and me and Cooks and yeah, we'd be on set and just go, "Why are we here? <laughs> like, we don't deserve to be here and stuff like that," which is <laughs> pretty funny. But um, one of the highlights, I reckon, uh, footy golf with the D's was up there. Um, I'd had a couple of meetings sure. with them over the years, and um, they they'd said a couple of times they're like oh we'll make some videos with you i'm like that is so sick and then they obviously had football games to worry about and like they just didn't get around to it which is fair enough like you know in my head youtube's the priority but clearly not for a footy club <laughs> um yeah we, we we didn't quite get stuff off the ground and that happened a couple of years in a row and then the afl uh got on to me um and i um pitch footy golf again and then they're like who would you want to do it with i'm like well i've got connections at the d's um so maybe melbourne so it was cool because it was like i felt justified that my idea that i'd pitched a couple of years prior was coming to life and it came to life in the way that i wanted it to like i i think cookson said on the pod on this pod um not long ago like instead of pitching 
AFL goal recreations, which I think I can make my myself. I wanted to pitch stuff that um, is like our idea. It's a very YouTubery idea, but take it up a level. Yeah. And it was great. Like we had, you know, lapel mics and there was people with uh, the movie scene, but he scissor things like <laughs> cut, start. And, um, you know, Angus Brasher and Sam Wiedemann were sick. Um, and it was a fun game. There was a punishment at the end. There was two cams. It was, yeah. So footy golf with the D's is probably one of my favorites. And then I guess um, in terms of like working, like footy at home, um, yeah, I- ideally – well, I love footy at home. I, it wasn't exactly our idea or our content, but it was still cool to test ourselves in like an environment that wasn't ours. So even though like I don't know, doing little handball games isn't that big of a stretch <laughs> compared to footy golf, like it's, you know, we are still doing footy dumb, silly content. But just, yeah, it was just cool to see myself and Cookson be in a professional environment and, you know, rock up on time, film for nine hours. Um, you know, I, I think if you saw one of the episodes that was filmed on the back end of a day or seen one that was filmed at the start of the day, there's not much different. We kept the, uh, you know, the energy up, even though it, it's hard, like, I don't know, TV sets and whatever, it's, it's difficult. So it was yeah. cool. That, that, that made me feel really good because we were testing ourselves in a different way and, um, you know, I was really proud of like how we performed. It was, um, yeah, it was cool. That's awesome, man. I this is an interesting question because I don't think I even have the answer like myself if I was asked it. But do you think you have an idea of what like where you want to end up? Like, what's the ideal scenario for you? Because I get asked this about where I want to go with my channel. I'm like, I actually don't know exactly what that looks like yet. But like, if you do, you, if you could picture like what's the top, like where you, where do you want to go? Where, what's the ideal goal? Um, it changes all the time. Um, so, you know, when I started YouTube, it was radio host and which sounds weird, but that's where I wanted to go. And then, um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're, you're sort of in with the AFL. <laughs> my, yeah, my dad in particular, somebody who doesn't, some, a lot of people who don't quite yeah. get it always say this one to me, but they, and I think you spoke about it as well. Um, but they say, oh, so soon you'll get a full-time job at the AFL. And that's not my end goal. Um, sure. Uh, it, it would be very nice. Well, they're laying off all the staff at the moment in particular, which is quite sad. But So that's definitely not going to happen. But, um, yeah, a part of me always thinks of that, like that conundrum. Like, do I go the safety route of full-time work, but it's not building my brand. It's sort of, you know, oh, I, I've, I've achieved the skills or whatever to get a job with the D's or with the AFL or whatever. Would I take that? that route or continue with YouTube. And at this point in time, actually given the current climate, I probably would, no, nah, I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> at, at this point in time, um, I'm backing in the YouTube channel at the moment. So I am really content with doing some freelance hosting or, you know, whatever comes my way. Um, even though it could be quite quiet given footy may not come back, but um, yeah, some freelance stuff but just keep driving this YouTube channel. Um, and that, and that's like my, for the next few years, um, that is my goal. It's like to keep doing the YouTube channel, keep building this. I want it to look consistent. I want it to be consistent. I want it to flow really easily, you know, bits of content most days. Um, I just want it to be a little, a little machine on its own yeah and just see where i could push it but then also to survive i don't mind doing stuff for the afl or for the d's or for anyone who'll have me at this point in time but um <laughs> but then i also think of like the bigger picture um we worked with a production company on footy at home and they're just a couple of mates who have their own little office have their own equipment have a few staff members and they do like web stuff and they've done ads and stuff like that so um, it's only been a recent thought, but potentially, you know, when I get a little bit older and no one wants to see a boring man <laughs> kick a footy into a bin anymore, um, <laughs> I, at this point in time, sort of being involved in a production company, potentially off my own bat, like with my own name and 
well, not my own name. It wouldn't be Cade McDonald Productions. That's a bit <laughs> self-indulgent. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Something like a production company where I can still make content and be involved in it could be pretty cool. But at this point in time, you know, who knows? I could be stacking shelves at the end of this year if uh, <laughs> footy doesn't yeah. come back. <laughs> true, man. That's very true. Um, no, you'll be all right. Cool, man. All right. So uh, before we wind up, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Melbourne Football Club. Uh, like I said, I planned to talk about it a little bit earlier. Uh, you're a diehard Melbourne fan, just like I'm a diehard West Coast fan. I think we're quite like, like-minded in that respect. Where does the Melbourne love come from? Because if I'm not mistaken, you're in from an area... Do they mostly support Geelong, where you're from? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're from... You know, we've gr- grown up in Geelong. I went to school in Geelong. Um, and then grew- lived in Torquay, which is about 15 minutes outside of it. But... yeah. Um, it just came from dad, so he, oh, he right. might be the he might be the curse. But he, he came over from Scotland when he was six, and he got here in 1964, and um, that was the last year the D's won a flag. And he was in in the classroom, and all the kids were like, "Oh, who do you go for?" To this little Scottish kid, you know, who do you like in the footy? Who do you like? And he he said like, because the D's were in the grand final, there was Melbourne like red and blue stuff all over the streets, balloons, streamers, scarves, everything. He's like, oh, I like them. So he um, he started going for Melbourne all his life, and um, yeah, he's you know he doesn't have a Scottish accent or anything. He's just just as Aussie as it gets. But he um, yeah, he, he went for the D's from then onwards, and he's probably seen the like most unsuccessful sixty year period of any footy club <laughs> potentially. So maybe he has to go back to Scotland, and we might win. But um, <laughs> yeah, he, he went for the D's. And just took me to every game. And I, I don't really know, can't recall when it started, but I just loved them. Um, and mum went for the Cats. and But she she's like, she goes for the Cats, but she knows how much a Melbourne game affects me. So yeah. she tip, tipped the Ds every week, basically <laughs> supports them. Because she knows yeah. like I'm an absolute loser if we lose and I'll carry <laughs> on. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I just started with dad. And then, I don't know, I just loved them. And yeah just growing up in Geelong wasn't easy because between like 07 and up until now they've had like one of their most successful 10 year 13 year stretches in their entire football history and we've had one of the worst you know six or seven year periods in the history of the game like one of the most unsuccessful periods so here I am like a diehard D going to the the G where it's pouring rain with 13,000 other D supporter supporters every week and then I'd have Cats fans giving me shit who would just watch the 100-point flogging from home and not go into the game 10 minutes away. And I'm like, you don't have the right to, to rinse me. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all, it all started with Dad. So I blame yeah. him. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, unlucky there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, <laughs> I do want to ask you about that, not, not to rub salt in the wound, but like, yeah. because you've obviously, like you said, it's been an, a rough trot for the Ds since pretty much you were... Um, what, like five years old now I'm thinking that, in the 2000, 2000 grand final. Um, but like, how do you keep up that passion? So for me, I actually think my passion doubled in 2008 when the Eagles got really shit because after the like the, the Judd Cousins saga, I got really into the idea of a rebuild and I was like, oh, fuck, I'm going to just like follow this journey with them. And that's why like 2018 so special for me. But for the Ds, like... You never really got out of that rebuild phase. Like the, I'm talking the Mark Neal era, the Dean Bailey era. But your passion doesn't – it never seemed to waver. Like, what is it that drew you to the Ds to make you, like, so passionate? Did you lose interest at any point? No, I I can – I never – I don't think – I think the number of games I went through only increased in time. Like, the, um, the more I was allowed to go by myself, the more I just went to Ds games. So, I think – you know, in year 12 in 2013, we won two games and I would have gone to at least 10 or 11. Wow. And then, um, yeah, the more I could go to, the more I just went because there's nothing better. Like I, I used to dislike the town Geelong for a little bit. And when I was applying for radio jobs, I, I loved that story of, oh, I'm going to be the guy that gets out of here. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that going to Dubbo or Bunbury or like um, Ballarat is um, – <laughs> It is uh, the big New York City that is in every movie scene. But I, I just wanted to get out. And, um, yeah, so I, I guess, like, the escape would be, you know, sit at home all week and then I get to go on the train and get to go 
to the G and it was my favourite place and, it, you know, going to Melbourne was such a thrill. Um, but I don't know. I don't – like all my mates, if they're losing by 60 points, they turn it off and I can't. I don't know why. I just – I want to watch the game through. All my mates, if they're down by 186 points to Geelong in 2011, would probably leave. But I sat there the whole game. I've got no idea why I'd do it to myself because it, it does – it's <laughs> – it's just not productive. It's mentally draining and frustrating. So (laughs) I don't know. I just, I I wish I probably was a little bit less passionate because I've wasted a lot of money and a lot of time, but for some reason I, I can't change that. I just, I don't know. I'll, I'll just always be there and eventually it'll turn. I always, I always tell people like, I just need, I need a flag. I need one flag. Like all I want to see is one flag, but for my football mental health, I wouldn't mind um, just a six year period where you're just consistently in that, in the eight. Like I just need, even if we're not, you know, even if we, you know, finish six and bow out, you know, we just have those years where you're just winning more games than you're losing. I just need like a, a mini dynasty just to get me. Cause it's been, you know, since 2006 to now, we've made finals once and it's been really awful every other year, like five or six wins, if that. So I just need a bit of a break from that. And I don't think that's too much to ask. <laughs> I think that is very reasonable, mate. But then when you say, like, obviously growing up around Geelong um, and probably not liking the club that much, 2018 for you must have been spectacular, particularly that elimination final. What was that like for you? Yeah. Yeah. But to rub more salt in the wounds, round one they beat us by a point because Max oh, made yeah. it from thirty meters out, and that and then Zach Tui, right? Yeah, that's so. That's the one game I want to win. Like Dad and I would always joke, I don't mind if we're last as long as we beat Geelong, because they're <laughs> hell. Like some of the supporters won't even know who their captain is, but they'll go, "Oh, we beat Melbourne on the weekend." And it's like <laughs> you don't even watch the games, mate. But um, yeah, so I went to round one. And we've nearly knocked off the Cats. I think they made a prelim the year before and we were just coming up. Like, we were just showing signs. We've nearly knocked off the Cats. And I was like, oh, my God. And it, it, it wasn't heartbreaking. I, I was just so proud. I was like, this team is going to be something. Oh, my God. And then later on in the year, I went down to Simmons uh, or GMHBA and um, we were dominating them. And, and it was one of the best days performances ever. And they all young, like. It's the, your Petrarca's a 21, 22, your Oliver's a 19, and we're beating, like, your Dangerfields and Selwoods. And I can't explain the pride. It's like these are these are my warriors in my town against all the people that I hate, and they are <laughs> digging deep. And it's just, it, oh, I don't know, I just love it so much. So they've just put in the most amazing performance up by 30 at three-quarter time, and I'm like, oh, we're going to do it. Like, this is crazy. I think in the... Last quarter, we have four or five shots at goal to end it. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm getting that confused with last year's game. But I think we had the footy early to, and we could almost end it. But then the catch just kept coming back, kept coming back. And then Zach Tui. The weird thing is, like, when I was filming that, I'm like, regardless, this is great content. I'm either filming a kick after the siren or <laughs> I'm filming a win at Simmons. So a part of me was like, when we lost, I was like, oh, that's – Jeez, this is a good tally. <laughs> this is great tally. Um, which sort of, and I had a few beverages. So it was, that was a great night at the footy, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so then that happened and it was just like the same old, like we, we can't beat them. We cannot beat them. It's the one game I want to win and we can't beat them. And then we dropped two games against them, a game against the Saints, you know, a plethora of games under a goal. And I think we missed out on the top four by a game. So it was like we had missed chances to go top four. And then they beat us twice by a goal. They beat the Bulldogs by like under a goal. And they make the top eight by a game. It was just, what the yeah. hell? Like, how have they made the eight and how have we not made the top four? Anyway, it's fourth. I mean, it's fifth first eight and it's the Cats. And that whole week I'm like, oh, my God, this is <laughs> – this will kill me. Like, this is the first time we've made <laughs> finals in over a decade and I have to burst you along. And, but yeah, that is the best night I've ever had at the footy. I've never been to a game with 90,000 and it was all red and blue. It was a sea of red and blue. It was loud. 
it was just so dominant and they were all so young like i don't know you sam wiedemann's took the piss and he's he was 20 or something at the time um just this young outfit like there's no veterans like jonesy was a veteran and maybe jordan lewis but apart from that it's like just a bunch of 20 year olds dominating your salwards and all i don't know it was just crazy and yeah it was just the best night ever and when mitch hannon kicked that goal oh i've never yelled like i felt like I felt dizzy. Like, I was yelling so loud. I felt really dizzy. Um, yeah, it was crazy. That's awesome, mate. I love that story. Um, that, st- that, that story about GMHBA while you were talking made me feel fucking depressed when, when there were <laughs> points <laughs> up. I was like, oh, was my like, God, oh this my poor God, bloke. This um, <laughs> um, oh, that, that's funny. Um, a couple questions to go before we wrap up. I, I wanted to keep this fairly coronavirus-free, but I do want to ask, hypothetically... Um, and this is hypothetical, I don't want to go depressing, but let's say Melbourne goes under, right? They don't survive financially, but then the other 17 teams do next year. Uh, could you follow another team? Is your passion for Melbourne greater than it is for footy, or do you think you'd take a step back? Where would you be at? Oh, I'd be in all sorts. It's, um, um, I do have other teams that I like. Like, I like the Pies, I like the Bulldogs, I like GWS, but it'll it would never even ever get close to being the same. Yeah. Um, and and like even it's like oh I love the D's, but it's it's a childhood thing as well. Like and it's sort of like you know the, these players are the custodians or oh, not custodians? What, what is it? We're, like these guys are the ones carrying the club at the moment. But when I think of Melbourne, I think of Cameron Bruce, Brad Green. Russell Robinson, yeah. David Needs, Adam Uze. So when I say I go for the Deeds, it's not like, oh, I go for Kyle Dunkley. It's like I go for <laughs> this 150-year history. Like I go for the MCG. I go for Jim Steins. I, like I love the Melbourne Footy Club. And yeah. to erase that and just go, oh, I go for the Pies now, it would be, yeah, I don't think I could do it. And also, like, I, yeah, I think – my love is for Melbourne. Like, it's not – like, if I don't see a game all weekend, it would be a bit weird because I do watch one or two at least. But if I don't see a game all weekend and watch the Ds, like, I've watched the footy that weekend because the footy yeah. is Melbourne Melbourne take on. Um, so, jeez, I'd be chipping in all of me <laughs> buckaroonies to try and get them out of that hole. <laughs> it would make much of an impact. But I'd rather – yeah, live in a hut and have a Melbourne footy club than not have a Melbourne footy club. Yeah, man, I, I'm probably in the same boat with the Eagles. That's very true. Cool, man. Um, all right, we'll wrap up, sort of. Uh, second last question. What's on the horizon for you in the future? Now, obviously, these are uncertain times, and I'd imagine, obviously, no football season. Like you, oh, sorry, you, like myself, probably going to be gagging for football content. But, like, what is your plan this year in terms of content? What can your subscribers expect to see? Um, I just want to entertain, uh, pretty like as simple as it sounds. Uh, yeah, part of me is like, is it weird to be taking the piss with Cook in videos given the current circumstances? And like, do I look a bit naive or a little bit, I don't know, out of touch if I'm doing little AFL guess who's or little silly stuff while some serious things are happening in the world? And it is uncertain and it is scary. And, like, will people think I'm being disrespectful if they've lost their job and they click on YouTube and I'm taking the piss? So a part of me was like, oh, it feels weird to be, um, I don't know, doing content at this point in time. But then um, I've seen stuff where, not on my videos, but I've seen people write on, like, little things that have popped up online, like, oh, this made me my day or, like, um, uh, this – these 15 minutes that I watched, um, you know, uh, gave me something to think about or watch other than just the bad news that we've got. So I just thought, um, you know, if I'm not getting six of the boys around and disobeying rules and we don't care, we don't care, you know, if, if I'm quite uh, conscious of the, uh, the current climate, I think oh, I just want to entertain. So I'm going to try and do as much footy stuff as I can. And if there's eyes on it, then easy happy days um i'll continue to pump it out and even if it doesn't reach you know the sort of numbers that it was reaching last year because there aren't much footy around it 
that's fine. Like if people are still interested, I'll I'll make it. <clears throat> but I'm also keen to. I've always wanted to mix up my content as well. And over the 2018 summer, I had a bit of a dip at it, and then over last year's summer, I had a bit of a dip of, at it. Um, so yeah, I'm keen to. You know, I want to be as flexible and as um, versatile as I can on YouTube. But I think I've done all right at doing that with footy. Um, so I want to do that with other content as well. So. I don't know. I just want to entertain and there'll be plenty of stuff and consistent stuff and regular stuff on my channel for people to check out anyway. So just entertain and uh, see us through. And once the footy's back, I'll go watch the D's spank the cats. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, mate. I like it. Um, final question. You might've been expecting this because I steal this question from uh, my idol, True Geordie, but I think it's a really good way of asking, uh, tying up the interview because it's really good sort of in, to indicate um, that person's mindset. So my question is, how would you like to be remembered? Um, I love that question at the end of uh, true Geordie stuff. I reckon that's yeah. um, it, it's a good one. I, 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 I think I'm probably too young to really uh, grasp what that means. Like when he talks to like your Alan Shearers who have like a, a legacy, that's a cool thing to look back on. But, you know, if I was to go in the current climate, I think – I'd be disappointed that I haven't uh, done what I've achieved, what want to achieve yet. So I guess I just want to, um, I don't know, just I just want to be remembered by like my family and stuff as like like a good person, as cliche as that is. Like, um, you know, I, I want my mum to be like, geez, he was good whenever he popped around and wasn't just here for a, a hot dinner, <laughs> which seems to be the case recently. I uh, struggle at the cooking, so I'll go around yeah. to mum's, but. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to be someone who was yeah really respectful, really nice, and just pretty kind-hearted. And apart from that, like you know, there's the ego in me that goes, if there's no statue at the MCG, what's the point of it all? But um, <laughs> if that, you know, if I, I, if yeah, if people don't remember me apart from my family, then that's that's fine by me. I was just the kid who chucked some videos up for a couple of years, so it's it's more important to me that yeah, that I'm remembered to being a good person by like people who are close to me that's um yeah that's more important than anything else cool mate i love that answer that's a great answer well uh we've gone a little bit over time but um i've had a great time talking to you caden thank you so much for coming on uh, maybe um you know if there's not too much footage to talk about in a couple of months we'll have you back on and cook and all that if you're if you've got some awesome. time so um i hope it's been fun for you for all the listeners um if you're not already sub to caden i'm going to leave all your links to your social media in the description and stuff um and thanks for watching um caden take care perfect thanks for having me cheers